is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. No, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning. And we are so pleased to be in your house and with others, other believers that we build into one another. And we ask that your spirit would join with us this morning as we worship the great God. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you remain standing, please. It's about Global Smiles, the mission that... I'm aware of, this is seem, doesn't seem to be doing well, I could probably yell, but um, I became aware of Global Smiles through one of our sponsored children. Uh, years ago, as some of you know, Steve and I were very active in Compassion International, and over the years since 1994, we had seven sponsored children. We were fortunate that some of them actually went through the whole program and graduated at the age of 18. And we've been fortunate that three of those adult children found us on Facebook, and we still correspond with them. Um, we now have five sponsored grandchildren. So I wanted to mention this uh, because our oldest sponsored child, Maria, who lives in Ecuador, had contacted me several years ago, and she was starting to have children. Well, she had the one little girl, Christina, who was a darling little girl. Then she had a little girl named Kayla. And Kayla was born in 2019, and she was born with a cleft palate. And as you can see in the first picture there, it's not, it wasn't really bad. And some of these cleft palates are different than others because some of them are very obvious and the children are terribly ostracized because of them. But any of them, generally, they cause problems in their health because of the difficulty with nursing to begin with and then eating later on. And Maria let us know that she had taken Kayla to a charitable group called Global Smiles, who came to Ecuador once a year. And they, she stood in line all day with the baby, the baby was eight months old at that time, and she was fortunate enough to be chosen as one of the children to benefit from it. So she had her first surgery, and then you can see in 2020, there was literally no scar or anything, but she still needed work done on the inside of her mouth. So um, they are actually there this month in Ecuador again, and Kayla should be on their list to have some final surgeries. But as you can see from the middle picture, she looks perfectly lovely, and I saw some videos that Maria put online this week, and I told Steve, I said, I think she may be a trifle spoiled because she just she has, that, she has that attitude. So anyway, um, we really love Global Smiles. We think it's a good mission to support. They go to several <laughs> underprivileged countries, and these children get immense benefits from it. If you can imagine if you had a child or grandchild that was born with this problem and you didn't have the money or the places to take them for treatment, this organization does that. So I ask that you think about that and that you'll be generous with your time. Um, so thank you. I understand. <laughs> I had a remote over here. <laughs> No, it is, sometimes those batteries kind of flip around inside the handheld, so it, it wasn't anything personal. You did good. So. We all have different personalities, don't we? I mean, there are some traits that we carry over that our parents or even our grandparents had. Uh, you've heard of the nature or nurture argument, I'm sure, going through the years, which one caused and influenced that person's personality and how they act. We have traits that are genetic, and sometimes we have issues that, that carry from the habits of our parents that they had while they were pregnant, like smoking or drinking or lack of medical access, uh, the presence of heavy metals in their environment, or a multitude of other factors can cause how we turn out. That's the same way with those that 
have this cleft palate. These kids had no choice in whether they, they had this medical condition or not. Most of the time, their parents had no clue either. Asian, Latino, and Native Americans have the highest incidence of cleft palates. One way to help any preborn is to try teaching the parents proper health care habits and, and get them the prenatal diets that are beneficial to the, the healthy growth of their babies. And you get into these countries and you know their medical facilities are sometimes 1950s, 1960s technology. So that's why it's so good for organizations like that to come in and, and be able to do these things. There's a difference in caring for children and not caring. This church is very much pro-life, and I'm proud of that, and that includes the care of these little ones after they're born, too. If we look at the various cultures that have developed over the centuries, you'll see a, a marked difference between those who value children and those that do not. May we always be aligned with God on, on these issues, and may God bless the little children. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us a softened heart, a heart of flesh and not a heart of stone. And as we go through your word, <clears throat> reveal to us the difference for those who would not listen to you and, and those that would. Those that, that would deny your existence and those that, who will follow you wherever you lead them. Encourage us today in our walk with you. And may you be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to cover a lot of ground. Oops. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. Uh, but it's more of a, a scan than it is in-depth studies uh, for the rest of this chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Genesis. Last week we saw how Cain, thanks to Satan, had given in to sin and allowed his jealousy and emotions to take control of his actions. He coerced his brother, Abel, to go and take a walk with him. Well, that was a walk that, uh, that Abel would never come back from. Cain killed him dead. And God could have wiped Cain completely off the face of the earth. But instead, God put a per curse on him. Cain was allowed to live, and in the process, his family would grow. So Cain lay with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Arad, and Arad was the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael was the father of Methushael, and Methushael was the father of Lamech. Let me mention something here. Do any of you work with Microsoft Word or Office of any type? <clears throat> yes. Then you know that if you type in a word that, that doesn't recognize, it'll underline it in red. Now, you've got to figure out whether that's spelled correctly, or you want to ignore it, or you want to add it to the dictionary. Well, I had a lot of those on this section. This section. And, and guess what? It doesn't tell me how to pronounce these names either. So... Um, you just bear with me. If you hear a name pronounced differently than what you've heard before, just figure that's my hillbilly showing up. <laughs> so if, if Cain is a wanderer, why is he trying to build a city? Maybe he wanted to make a fortified structure to protect himself and his immediate family from being killed by those who weren't related to him. Uh, well, anyway, related closely to him. So perhaps Cain just wanted to prove God wrong and say, hey, I'm planting my flag here. And this is where I'm going to stay. I'm not going to wander. I know, I had a reference into, I'm the wanderer, I'm the wanderer. <laughs> That's what I think of every time I see it. <laughs> and then there's a the question of, well, where did Cain get his wife? Where did she come from? Have you ever wondered that? That's a little hard to fathom for us in the 21st century. The most reasonable explanation is that Cain's wife would have been either a sister or a cousin or a niece. Yuck. <laughs> I know, but there weren't many other people around. That was your choice. Hmm. It was either, um, it really wasn't until the laws of, that God gave to Moses that this was forbidden. That intermarriage couldn't happen between relatives. 
And you can read about that in Leviticus chapter 18, starting with verse 6. In our world today, we know that, that when we have intermarriage of family members, there's a high probability there will be some kind of genetic defect on the baby. Not so in the early age of humanity. You have to realize we're working in a, a close to perfect world as far as humans. Not in actions, maybe, but in how they were created. So there w just wasn't the impurity of the genes back then, early on. Man and woman were created perfectly. It's similar to the second law of thermodynamics. Simply put, it's believed that something that is perfect or greater cannot improve upon itself, but will, in, in fact, degenerate to a more imperfect or lesser state. In other words, it keeps degrading each generation. In the case of family genetics, uh, the more people there are, the more problems or issues with genetics there will be. And yes, he did marry his cousin. They become less perfect the further they move away from the original source. If we find it wrong to marry a relative, that's a good thing for us. And it's a good thing for the offspring. Back then, it wasn't as much of an issue as it would be today. Now, if someone in the future wants to question the Bible or say that there must have been other people created that we don't know about, that wasn't listed in the Bible, or they might say that there's people from outer space that came to Earth, then you can say, no, Cain just married his sister or niece. As weird as it may sound to us, Cain did marry a relative. Uh, it really isn't that far-fetched. I mean, we have heard and read of it happening in the hills of Appalachia and islands in the Pacific, not to mention Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. It probably still goes on somewhere. If someone asks you that question, you now have the answer. It may not be proper, may not be our moral understanding to marry a close relative today, but it wasn't prohibited at that point. So let's continue. Lamech married two women, one named Ada and the other Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal as he was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who play the harp and flute. Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Tubal Cain's sister was Naamah. And notice that now we have musical instruments being introduced and tools to work with, so it makes the ground easier to work. And they can sing along as they do it. <laughs> so here we have another issue that isn't permitted in today's culture. It's polygamy. Lamech married two women. It started in Cain's side of the family. There wasn't anything God had commanded or mandated. He just decided to do it, I guess. He didn't give Adam two women. God didn't. And God had meant for only one man and one woman to marry. There are good reasons for this that I won't get into today. <laughs> but to say, it's hard enough to remember one wife's birthday or anniversary, much less two of them. Just saying. Regardless, Lamech was a poet, though not in the sense that we know. He wasn't a romantic poet. He wrote the first poem in the Bible. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech, 77 times. Not one of your popular hits. This poem is Lamech's boast of what he will do if anyone attacks him. Revenge is on his lips and in his, in his mind. Maybe he's already committed to act, or he's giving a warning to anyone who would seek to harm him. In the future, there's a legend that Lamech took his son, Tubal Cain, out to hunt. And they see something in the brush, and, and Lamech tells Tubal Cain to shoot it with his arrow, and he does, and he kills it. Well, it turns out it's his great great granddaddy, Cain. Lamech has proposed, as he wrote in his poem, that he's killed somebody, and there's going to be revenge. So, in this poem, the legend goes that both of his wives had left him, and he's trying to win them back, and he's trying to explain to them in this poem that uh, they thought he was callous for killing a relative, and maybe it does run in the family, but he's trying to win them back. He 
Cain didn't brag like this when he killed Abel. But maybe Lamech thinks he should get the word out just in case someone wants to kill him for his actions and his misdeeds. So now if we get into some more of Adam and Eve's descendants, as we do, let me add this disclaimer. If you notice that there aren't many daughters or women mentioned by name, it's, these accounts don't include all of the children born to Adam and Eve, neither do the others. There are probably many more that we just don't even read anything about. Maybe they didn't do anything significant, but God wants us to know about these people. So Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel, since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. I believe that the, that the writer Moses is talking about the men and families in Seth's family line when he says they started to call on the name of the Lord. They were the ones who would worship God, not necessarily the family of Cain. This is the written account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And when they were created, he called them man. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. Well, I guess. <laughs> it would have been nice to know how many children they had, wouldn't it? Um, okay, rather than have a lot of words up here on the screen for this next chapter, I'm just going to have some names listed and how long they lived. <clears throat> I think you'll be wondering about the recorded ages of these people. When Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. And after he became the father of Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Seth lived 912 years and then he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he became the father of Kenan. And after he became the father of Kenan, Enosh lived 815 years and had some other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enosh lived 905 years and then he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he became the father of Mahakael. And the, after he became the father of Mahakalel, Kenan lived 840 years and had other sons and daughters. <clears throat> Altogether, Kenan lived 910 years, and then he died. When Mahalel had lived 80, 65 years, he became the father of Jared. And after he became the father of Jared, Mahalel lived 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Mahalel, I'm close, I'm so close. <laughs> I think I've pronounced it five different ways so far. <laughs> anyway, this man lived 895 years, and then he died. And when Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. And after he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived 962 years, and then he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him away. So let me put a little bookmark right there for a few minutes. Back in chapter 4, Cain's first son was named Enoch. The scripture doesn't say that he walked with God, but I'm guessing that he did not. The Enoch and Seth family only lived 365 years. This could be literal or figurative, but I take it as literal, 365 years. On top of that, he was a godly man. This is a man who looked to God for guidance in his life and worshiped God daily. Now, we're looking at all these years, 900 years, 960 years, whatever it is. I'm sh I heard one scientist say you have to realize that the the atmosphere was pure. The oxygen was much better than what we have now. There was no pollutions. There was no minerals buried that would be cancerous in the ground. Everything was perfect. This is why these people could live this long. Sin had not permeated everything in their society. They were still close to perfection. So they could live 900 and some years. That's what the scientists said. 
Not all scientists, I will say that, but creation scientists. And then there's something else we need to notice about Enoch. Enoch did not die. We don't have any other evidence, written or otherwise, of anyone else not dying except the prophet Elijah. And Enoch actually, he left the stage at an early age. He was a pretty young man. You might say he, was, he wasn't even middle-aged. <laughs> Seems like one day he was there, and the next day he was just gone. This should be encouraging to all of us. This is a first example that God will bring those who love him into his realm instead of sending them into eternal torment. It's one of the few evidences of an eternal afterlife that God promises his people. It may be an example that the Pharisees held on to for their promises of the resurrection of the dead to, that they would live with God forever. And it does reveal that God will remove his beloved from this world to be with him in the future. Jesus gives us another clear promise in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, where Jesus says, do not, be a fr do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to there prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. This tells me that there's a plan for our afterlife. And it sounds very promising for those who live in Christ. God gives us the first example with Enoch. He does it again with the prophet Elijah. Enoch and Elijah weren't raised from the dead. They were instantly brought into the presence of the Almighty God. It was a translation, not a resurrection. And we being Christians are promised a resurrected life. Unfortunately, many of us who live in Christ will also die in Christ. But death is not the victor. The good news is Jesus has conquered death. And those Christians will be truly resurrected to live with Christ. Let's go back to Genesis now. Methuselah. When Methuselah had lived 887 years, he became the father of Lamech. And after he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Methuselah lived 969 years, and then he died. I know it can be confusing, but th this is not the same Lamech that was in Cain's line. Uh, back when I was growing up, it was common to hear the phrase, well, they're as old as Methuselah. You don't hear that much anymore. There's a lack of biblical knowledge these days among young people. Methuselah was, in fact, the oldest living man who ever walked the earth, ever. So when Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah and said, He will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. After Noah was born, Lamech lived 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Lamech lived 777 years, and then he died. Look at the difference between those two families. In Cain's line, there was a, a Lamech who it was rumored had killed Cain. That Lamech had threatened revenge on any who would seek to harm him. And even though Cain's Lamech deserved punishment, it looks as though none was ever given. That Lamech was evil and courted evil. In Seth's line, Lamech was hopeful. He was hopeful that Noah would bring comfort to the family in the future. Seth Lamech was hoping that Noah would be able to turn the curse from the Garden of Eden around and the family wouldn't have to endure the, the painful hardship of working the land anymore and that the ground would produce more blessings. Maybe the Lamech and Seth line wanted both family lines to coexist, to come back together, to be rejoined, to live in harmony again. But he had hope. These are two men with the same name, but with totally, totally different attitudes. Many times we can choose how we think in life. Our, our attitudes depend on what we feed them. Remember the story about the two wolves last week. We need to feed our minds and our hearts with the good things that God has given to us. After Noah had lived, after Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
and we'll get into more of that story next week. Commentator and pastor Bob Utley says that we can see two lines of humanity forming in Seth's line and Cain's. One might say that we have a line from the good side and one from the evil side. And still these two families interact. They are related. And in the midst of both, we see that they are, there are people who love God. One side of the family has godly values. The others, not so much. We see this manifested in many families, don't we? Two people are raised in the same home, yet have two totally opposite personalities and thought processes. There is something going on that they both had the same opportunities, yet one would feed on the good and the other focused on and fed on the bad. Two entirely different outcomes and children that were from the same homes. You would think that they would produce the same results. So how can we help our families to prosper? One way to do that is to be aware that we, what we feed our children or what they are being fed. There are surveys and reports that are coming out that children have had too much screen time and it's affecting their mental capacities, creating disorders and, and giving them, even in later life, suicidal tendencies. Cut it out. Get them away from the smartphones. If they need a phone, get them a flip phone. Or bring back pay phones. It worked for me. <laughs> there are also reports coming out that a child or adolescent's mind isn't fully formed until they are well into their 20s. And yet we have government and medical officials who say that these young people will be okay if we uh, allow them the opportunity to use drugs like marijuana. After all this time, they still don't know the full effects of marijuana use on young minds. But they do know this, it alters their thought process, it stifles their mental growth, it makes them duller, paranoid, and adds to their inability to work out large and, and complicated projects. As parents and grandparents, let's try to feed the goodness of Jesus into our kids and our grandkids. We're the first line of defense for them, so we need to act like it. We need to be voting for people who want to take care of our kids, not cause them to be unproductive individuals who need assistance in life. We need to be aware of what our school boards, our teachers, doctors, and coaches are telling our kids. We need to limit their screen time and help them understand that everything they find on their phones isn't real. Women aren't supposed to have perfect bodies. True men respect women and don't use or abuse women. And that babies are to be treasured as a true gift of God. And that's a start, but we still need to instill the power of God's word and, and live in God's presence. When we don't, the family, the church, the culture, and the nation breaks down. We must keep Jesus in our hearts at all times. Let him live there today. <clears throat> we need to have it recorded that as a people, we have made a decision to live according to the words of Jesus. Let it be said of us at that time. Men, women, and children began to call on the name of the Lord. And then, and only then, will we see true repentance, forgiveness, and a renewal in God's spirit in our lives. I pray that this renewal, this awakening down in Asbury stretches out across this land. It's not just a momentary revival, but that there is a, a change of heart, of mind. It's not just worship, that it is something that interacts and affects people for generations to come. As Sharon and Brandon lead us in our last song, we, we praise him because he lives. If you need prayer, please come down in front and I'll pray with you. Let's stand as we sing.